Good morning, everyone. Good to be with you all today. I want to start my remarks, as I often do, on matters relating to China. As many of you saw, I met with Yang Jishe uh, last week in Hawaii. We had a very frank discussion about the Chinese Communist Party's unprovoked aggression on a number of fronts, and I pressed him for more transparency on COVID uh, for the good of the world. We're concerned by Beijing's behavior, and we're not the only ones. And he and I talked about that. Our friends and partners are finding their voice and taking action to counter China's malign activities, particularly in Europe. Within the past week, I spoke to EU foreign ministers and also to a democracy forum in Copenhagen. They clearly recognize the threat that China poses to the free world and to the rule of law. After the EU-China summit this week, both President Michel and President von der Leyen publicly echoed many of the concerns that I've expressed previously. While I was meeting with Yang, the G7 released a statement condemning Beijing, Beijing's crackdown in Hong Kong. The world's leading telecom operators, including Spain's Telefonica, as well as Orange, O2, Geo, Bell Canada, Telus, and Rogers, and many, many more, are becoming clean telcos, disconnecting from the Chinese Communist Party infrastructure. They're rejecting doing business with tools of the CCP surveillance state, companies like Huawei. I'll speak more about how we're working to consolidate Europe's awakening to the folks uh, to the folks at the German Marshall Fund in just a few days. It's all good to start, but we have to keep at it. The empty promises and tired platitudes of the Chinese Communist Party put forth that last week's China-Africa summit won't create the free and prosperous future that the African people deserve. And the U.S. will keep speaking up for the Chinese people, too. Last week, CCP authorities sentenced human rights lawyer and defender Yu Wen-Sheng to four years in prison. We continue to call for the release of all of those justly imprisoned in China for exercising their basic human rights and their fundamental freedoms. Last item on China, a positive one in case you all think I only criticize them. The CCP is raising the protected status of pangolins and removing them from its official list of animals used for approved traditional medicines. I think that's great news. I called on the CCP to take similar steps to respond to other endangered species and shut down high-risk wildlife wet markets permanently. Moving on, today I have Nathan with me. Uh, we're releasing our annual con country reports on terrorism. I hope everyone sees that this administration has taken on terrorist threats that other administrations simply downplayed. We designated the IRGC, including its Quds Force, as a terrorist organization, the first time the authority has ever been used on a foreign government. We kept pressure on Iranian proxies like Hezbollah by encouraging our partners to designate or ban them, as Paraguay, Argentina, and now the United Kingdom did just last year. Last year, too, we held the first of two ministerials focused specifically on counterterrorism in the Western Hemisphere. No administration has forged closer ties in our hemisphere and alliances working on important problems like counterterrorism, as we have done. The Defeat ISIS coalition has remained strong. It's completed the destruction of the so-called physical caliphate in Iraq and Syria. And thanks to our great U.S. military, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi is dead. Now, to be clear, there's still counterterrorism work to do. ISIS and al-Qaeda branches and affiliates in Africa, Venezuela, and Cuba, cozy ties with terrorists and increasing ELN attacks in Colombia are problems that remain. But we're undaunted in our pursuit of bringing terrorists to justice. I'm pleased uh, today to announce that the State Department has increased our reward offer, now up to $10 million, for information about the location of the new leader of ISIS. Coordinator for Counterterrorism Sales will uh, today spend some time with you, working through, talking you through uh, his team's report. He's here with me to answer all of the questions you have. I mentioned previously for a moment the Maduro regime, a few comments on Venezuela. Over the last two weeks, the illegitimate Venezuelan Supreme Court has decreed a new regime-aligned electoral commission and stolen the name and branding of two major political parties, replacing their leadership with Maduro's lackeys. These are unconstitutional actions. They make a mockery of democratic processes. And the Venezuelan people are fighting to protect those very freedoms that they so richly deserve. The best pathway out of the Venezuelan crisis is through a broadly acceptable transitional government to administrate free and fair presidential and parliamentary elections. The Maduro regime has also mismanaged Venezuela's abundant natural resources to the point that a country with one of the world's largest oil reserves 
must import gasoline from Iran. Today, the United States is sanctioning five Iranian ship captains who delivered around a million and a half barrels of Iranian gasoline to Venezuela in support of the illegitimate Maduro regime. These captains' assets will be blocked and they won't be able to operate in U.S. waters. Mariners who do business with Iran and Venezuela will face consequences from the United States of America. We will continue to support the National Assembly Interim President Guaido and the Venezuelan people in their quest to restore democracy. Turning to another rogue actor, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Last Friday, the IAEA Board of Governors adopted a resolution calling on Iran to provide the IAEA inspectors the information and access it's obligated to provide. I want to thank Director Grossi and his team for their faithful work. Iran's denial of access to IAE inspectors and refusal to cooperate with the IAEA's investigation of potentially undeclared nuclear material and activity raises serious questions about Tehran's efforts and what it is precisely that they are trying to hide. Iran's refusal to cooperate is wholly separate from the JCPOA. This is simply about whether Iran is honoring its own legally binding safeguards obligations. If Iran fails, if it fails to cooperate with the IAEA obligations, the international community must be prepared to take further action. Today, Special Representative Hook is briefing members of the United Nations Security Council on our diplomacy to prevent the arms embargo from expiring uh, on Iran in October of this year. Without action, on the 18th of that month, Iran will be able to purchase advanced weapon systems and become the arms dealer of choice for terrorists and rogue regimes all throughout the world. This is unacceptable. Iran has been under arms restrictions by the United Nations since back in 2007. And one of the greatest failures of the Iran nuclear deal was to allow these restrictions to expire without regard to how the regime behaved. The resolution that we will present to the UN Security Council would extend the conventional arms embargo on the leading state sponsor of terror. Our focus now is to work with the Security Council to pass this resolution. But in the event it doesn't happen, I would remind the world that the Obama administration's officials said very clearly that the United States has the unilateral ability to snap back sanctions into place. Two quotes. First, from President Obama, he said, if at any time If at any time the United States believes Iran has failed to meet its commitments, no other state can block our ability to snap back those multilateral sanctions. And then my predecessor, Secretary Kerry, said, look, if we're not happy, we can go to the Security Council, and we alone, we alone can force a vote on snapping back those sanctions. The legal options in the Security Council are clear. Our great preference is to have a council resolution that would extend the arms embargo, but we are determined to ensure that that arms embargo continues. Uh, To change gears just a bit, and then I'll take some questions. Uh, We also assert ourselves as a force for good throughout the world. It's not just about the dangers we face. Last week, we released an additional $93 million to boost boost, boost COVID assistance throughout the world, bring the State Department and USAID's assistance total to more than $1.3 billion, more than 100, across more than 120 countries. Tomorrow, uh, interagency leaders will convene the private sector counterparts as part of our program called Asia Edge, or Enhancing Development and Growth Through Energy. Asia's energy demand is projected to increase by 60% in 2040, and we're proud to work through our revamped development finance corporation to help pair up countries with American companies, the best partners for helping meet that need. Also tomorrow, uh, Senior Advisor to the President Ivanka Trump, Ambassador John Richmond, and I will unveil the 2020 State Department Trafficking in Persons Report. Crushing human trafficking at home and abroad has been a high priority for President Trump and our administration, and you'll have plenty more tomorrow about how we will continue to do that. Uh, one last item. As the country begins to reopen, the department is getting our passport team back on the field. In the coming weeks, they will aggressively tackle applications that were put on hold because of the pandemic and provide fast and efficient service for Americans that they rightfully expect. Now happy to take some questions. Hi, Rob. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, Hi, good to see you. Good to see you too, uh, Mr. Secretary. Um, The Iranian president, Hassan Rouhani, um, said that Iran has no problem with talks with the United States, and I quote, 
only if the United States fulfills its obligations under the nuclear deal, apologizes and compensates Tehran for its withdrawal from the 2015 deal. Your response then? Yeah, I mean, that's not remotely serious. The United States has been clear about our expectations. We've been clear about our goals. We ask the Islamic Republic of Iran to behave like a normal nation. We're happy to engage in conversations with them when the time is right. Um, but uh, the conditions that suggest somehow uh, we give a bunch of money to the Iranians so they can foment terror around the world is simply ludicrous. It's, it's just not how this administration behaves. Good morning. Uh, first, Sudan, uh, Sudan is the foreign minister saying that the country is kneeling in Egypt. They ask the uh, government uh, compensation uh, for the uh, families uh, of victims of the uh, embassy's uh, bombing. Uh, is this accurate? Are you looking at any close uh, deal? Uh, on Libya, are you willing to, uh, for a regional conflict in Libya between Turkey and Egypt specifically, and on Lebanon, the Lebanese uh, people are suffering uh, financially, economically, So I'll take them in reverse order. On Lebanon, we've, our, our policy is very clear. Uh, we are fully prepared to support a government that conducts real reforms and operates in a way that is not beholden to Hezbollah. Uh, when, that, when that comes, when the government demonstrates, whoever that is, demonstrates their willingness and capacity to do that, I think not only the United States, but the whole world will uh, move in to assist the Lebanese government get its economy back on its feet. Uh, we're prepared to do that. It's the right thing for the Lebanese people. It's what the protests that are taking place, not only in Beirut, but all around Lebanon, are asking for. Real reform, real change, a fundamental shift away from Hezbollah as the governing power inside of Lebanon. Uh, second, for Libya. Uh, we've worked closely with our European partners to try and get these talks restarted. Uh, I was in Berlin now several months back. Uh, the mission set remains the same to get the fighting to stop, to reduce the number of arms flowing there from any place, whether that's from the Turks, from the Russians, from anyone, to reduce the uh, footprint of the military conflict, and then to find a political solution to resolve, to get a stable, peaceful situation in Tripoli and in Libya more broadly. Uh, we're, we're still hopeful that we can get all of those who have an interest there to the table to have these discussions and come to a political resolution. Uh, your first question was about Sudan. I spoke with the Prime Minister just uh, a couple of hours ago. Uh, we're working very closely with them to try and come to a solution so that we can get the right outcome for, for their new leadership and for the Sudanese people. I don't have any details that I can share with you, only that uh, my team on the ground there is working very closely with the Sudanese leadership to try and get a really good outcome, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be uh, forthcoming in the weeks ahead. Mm -hmm. Does that mean you don't have the support in the UN for an extended embargo that you wish to have? Well, I don't know. I, by the way, it's not, it's not a threat. The, what, I, what I've made clear is U.S. policy. It, it is unacceptable. It's unacceptable for the Europeans to have equipment inside of Iran, move into Iran, that can threaten the people of Europe. Right? People from Belgium to Denmark are a threat because of the expiration of an arms embargo on the world's largest state sponsor of terror. I'm, I'm hopeful that the whole world will accept the proposition that this arms embargo needs to be extended. Uh, they'll, they'll be an arms merchant, too. Not only will they take weapon systems in and purchase high-end weapon systems from Russia and China, but they'll sell their weapon systems all across the world, too. Uh, this is not the, this, this is a rogue regime. They shouldn't have the capacity to do that, and I am very hopeful that the whole world, when we, when we come to the point when this decision must be made, that they will come to the same understanding that the United States has, that this is dangerous for the world for this to have expired. Sure, go, sure, go ahead. You, you said you don't know. Does it mean you don't know you have enough support in the UN, or does it mean you don't know how the Europeans and the Russians are trying to act? We are out working diligently to make sure everybody understands the risk that's associated with the arms embargo expiring. This is really dangerous for the whole world, for the region. The Gulf states know it, too. There's tremendous support for what it is we're trying to do. I think, I think all but a couple of nations understand that this should not expire, and there's going to be a discussion about how it is that we extend it. Hi. Hi. Uh, 
Um, Israel may be annexing parts of West Bank and Jordan Valley in a week, and Jordan has said annexation could kill its peace treaty with Israel. UAE's ambassador to the U.S., Otaiba, said it would end any hopes of normalizing relations with the Gulf and Arab states. So my question is, how concerned are you about the potential ramifications of annexation? And do you favor an incremental approach or an immediate annexation of 30% as proposed in the White House uh, peace plan? And very quickly, um, are you trying to um, discourage or en encourage um, European nations to keep the United States off a list of countries for travel bans? They said that um, they're not looking to open travel with US when they reopen next mm -hmm. month. Um, and how can you argue that given the high rate of COVID here? Thank you. Um, so as for your second question, we've been working with countries all across the world, including our friends in Europe and the EU proper, uh, to determine how it is we can best safely reopen international travel. It's important for the United States to get uh, Europeans the capacity to travel back to the United States. It's important, very important for the Europeans uh, to fully reconnect with the American economy as well. I think leaders all across those two places understand the importance of this. And so we've been working with them for quite some time on this. I am confident that we will find a, uh, a set of conditions that create uh, a sufficient health and safety uh, protections uh, sufficient travel opportunity that will get the private sector that's important in this too. We have to uh, make sure that we have all of the elements in place to reopen travel between the EU and the United States. We're working on uh, finding the right way to do that, the right timing to do it, the right uh, tactics to have in place. Uh, we certainly don't want to reopen a play that jeopardizes the United States from uh, people traveling here, and we certainly don't want to cause problems anyplace else. I'm, I'm, I'm very confident in the coming weeks uh, we'll figure that out as between not only the United States and the EU, uh, but the United States and other parts of the world too. Uh, the State Department, Department of Transportation, Homeland Security are all working to develop plans and methods by which we can begin to get uh, global travel back in place. Uh, your, your first question was about Israel. We unveiled a Middle East peace vision uh, some number of months ago now, and we're continuing to work down that path. Uh, the decisions about uh, Israeli and ex extending sovereignty to other places are decisions for the Israelis to make. Uh, and we are talking to uh, all of the countries in the region about um, how it is we can manage this process forward. Our end state objective is, I think, the objective that uh, the uh, Prime Minister has certainly acknowledged he wants, right? He wants our, our Middle East peace of vision to be successful. The Gulf states have all indicated that they are, are hopeful that we can put that in place. Uh, I regret only that the Palestinian Authority has refused to participate in that. Right? They, simply, they simply have rejected this out of hand. We, we simply ask that they come to the negotiating table based on what's outlined in the uh, vision for peace, and they have chosen not to do that. They've chosen to, to threaten, to bluster, to assert that they're going to deny the ability to do security proper. That's not good for the Palestinian people. It's dangerous for the people that live in those places, too. What we've asked is for them to come together, for Israel and the Palestinian people to come to the table to negotiate a path forward and to find a resolution to this decades-long challenge. I, I remain hopeful that in the coming weeks we can begin to make real progress towards achieving that. Great. Thank you, Thank you all very much. Have a good day.